cheap and versatile, plastic is used for everything. Furniture, tools, storage containers, clothing, even tea bags and glitter on birthday cards. It's hard to imagine modern life without it. So much has been created that scientists have calculated the total amount ever made at 8.3 billion tons. And most of these items are used for only short periods of time, or even just once, before being discarded to litter land and sea. If nothing is done, we are heading towards a planet so full of plastic that the health of plants, animals and humans alike will be threatened. And yet, fossil fuel companies are investing billions of dollars in producing even more of it. We urgently need to rethink how we manage the plastic we use or find an alternative. I'm Juliana Schatz on the west coast of Canada to meet people dedicated to clearing plastic waste from our oceans. And I'm Omar Khalifa in France, where a movement is afoot to rid the country of oil-based plastic. It is now believed that plastic waste can be found on every beach in the world. From the busiest beaches to the most isolated and uninhabited islands, now no shoreline is untouched by plastic pollution. And if the current rate of global production continues, there could be more plastic than fish by weight in our seas by 2050. Here in British Columbia, people have decided enough is enough and are taking strides to stop the tragic destruction of our oceans. Ocean Legacy is a local foundation whose aim is to tackle the growing problem of plastic pollution along the 25,000 kilometers of coastline here. Chloe Dubois is one of the founders. I'm Juliana. I'm Chloe. Nice to meet you. Okay. All right, let's do it. All right. Tell me first. Ladies first. The British Columbia coast is made up of deep inlets and rugged island shorelines, so helicopter travel isn't just a joyride. It's essential. Today we're headed to the Klaikwat Sound and one of the 40,000 islands that dot the coastline here. These terrains are a bit tricky. Um, it's really hard to tell just how much debris is actually here because of the logs and rocks. We could spend years cleaning this island alone. It's being estimated that there's about 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean right now. And a lot of those pieces are free to move wherever they want around the planet. Aside from, you know, the unsightliness of pollution on these gorgeous beaches, what kind of problems do plastic pollution cause? When plastic reaches our oceans, it tends to act as little sponges. So any chemicals that are in the water, it will begin to absorb these chemicals in the plastic pieces. And this is very toxic and very dangerous for marine life. Every day, we're finding the new animal or whale that's been washed ashore with stomachs full of plastic. Given the amount of plastic here, I'm not surprised wildlife is suffering. Can we lift it? Yeah. Oh, gross. Oh, wow. It's a, yeah, you can tell this is an old refrigerator. There's no way we could make a dent cleaning this beach by ourselves. Fortunately, reinforcements are on the way. So the helicopter we came in on are bringing more and more volunteers to this remote area to clean up the beach. So they're bringing in maybe two dozen volunteers today. Many here come from different local environmental groups. Overall, there are 5,000 volunteers to call upon across the region. But with so much coastline to monitor, Chloe and her team rely on tip-offs posted on the Ocean Legacy website to prioritize the most crucial locations. Flip-flops. I have found like 40 flip-flops today. <laughs> are these here. bear marks? Yeah, so these are bear claw marks here in the foam because it smells fishy. So when it washes up on shore, the wildlife um, is searching for food and mistakes the styrofoam for being its food source. Once collected, the plastic is readied for transport back to the mainland. I am going to learn how to sling or attach one of these super sacks um, to a hook um, at the base of the helicopter so that it can lift it out of here. When he drops the hook, I'll grab the hook and run it over to you guys. You hook it up. OK, cool. Since Ocean Legacy started, the team have collected over five tons of plastic off islands like this. And they're keeping most of it out of landfills, too. 
But what happens to the plastic they collect? Chloe's invited me back to the recycling center in Vancouver to find out. What's the next step in the process? We take all of these random uh, hard plastic items and we're gonna shred them up. The fragments will then be sold on to companies who will breathe new life into them. Styrofoam will become picture frames, beach huts, and picnic benches, while bits of old tires will hit the road again as new tires. Ocean Legacy is even starting to engage high street companies such as Lush Cosmetics, who are using recycled plastic for their signature packaging. So in order to make the black pots, we've needed to turn this material, basically, into something that looks like this. So it's still a very small project, but we're looking now in our organization to grow this much larger to engage more industry and more cleanup groups so that uh, we can help create an economic value for these materials. They're organized as a nonprofit foundation, mm -hmm. which means that all their profits get funneled into research, education, and more cleanups. Nothing goes to waste here. So, Chloe, what are we turning this into? What's the next step? Right. We'll make fuel out of this. Wait, what? <laughs> How are you turning this into fuel? It's a clever solution. Plastic is made from fossil fuels, after all. To learn more, Chloe's taking me to the boat where they have a prototype of a machine they're developing on a larger scale. We've set our parameters and the machine is essentially heating up and we'll start to vaporize the plastics. The plastic is converted into fuel through a process of thermal decomposition called pyrolysis. The machine is airtight and oxygen free so that the plastic doesn't burn. As the temperature heats up to 410 degrees Celsius, it melts to become a liquid and then a gas. This passes through a tube into a container filled with cool water, where it condenses and forms oil. So who could obtain a machine like this? The larger scale technology that we're looking to develop would be ideal for remote, coastal, or even island communities uh, that don't have readily accessible fuel sources that, and are also inundated with plastic pollution everywhere. It makes sense that these remote communities can use that plastic as a resource towards something that will benefit the community. The machine will take three hours to turn the plastic into fuel. In the meantime, I'm off to check out another project, less focused on recycling and more on changing mindsets. It's at artist and author Douglas Copeland's studio on the other side of town. What are we looking at here? Oh, oh. Giant dolls. Uh, these are, yes, pretty big bobblehead dolls. There's the 20th century, 20th century way of looking at plastic as something shiny and happy and great. Then there's like the reality in the world right now and how we're adjusting to that. And so these guys here, uh, plastic boy, plastic girl, uh, they will be representing the future. These figures are part of Douglas's installation at the Vancouver Aquarium, and I'm getting them ready for their debut. Do you like your new outfit? Oh my God. He says, yeah, look at that. Oh, look at that. Douglas is using 11 tons of ocean plastic in his show. What inspired you to create this installation piece? I go up north, this place called Queen Charlotte Islands. About four years ago, I was up there and plastic bottles were suddenly washing up on my sacred beach. Oh. And it really, it was like an evangelizing moment for me. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, let's make an image of the trash, but one which has a bit of sort of emotional like tingle to it, I guess. Copeland isn't pretending to offer solutions, but he is hoping to engage audiences who ordinarily wouldn't stop to think about the problem. And ultimately, he's hopeful we can turn things around before it's too late. I'm heartened by the energy British Columbia is putting into tackling the problem of plastic pollution. Before I leave, I want to return to the Ocean Legacy boat to see how much fuel the machine has produced. So I'm seeing different colors. Is this the mixed oil separating into different It is, fuels? yeah. So what's going to be coming out of this machine is a mixed oil. And in that oil, we can separate into kerosene oil, diesel fuel, and petroleum products. So you can make electricity from it, uh, power your lawnmower, heat your home. How are you using this fuel? Currently, we're not making enough of the fuel to use it in a practical application. Um, so this is just our small pilot. But we've really got the world's interest right now in launching these units worldwide.
The fuel will emit greenhouse gases and other pollutants, but at least it takes plastic out of circulation and reduces the need for fossil fuel extraction. So can we use it in this ship? Well, yeah, let's do it. OK. Into the hold she goes. Ready? Yeah. That sounds good. Okay. This ship is running on plastic. To think it's the same plastic that we picked up off the beach. It's incredible. Ocean Legacy are planning to roll out these machines starting in British Columbia in one year's time. They aren't the first organization to try to turn plastic into fuel or to recycle it. But what impresses me about Chloe and her team is the determination which drives them to take a multi-pronged approach to tackling plastic pollution. It's a problem that won't go away if we continue to use and discard such huge amounts of plastic. But what I've seen here gives me hope that if other groups around the world were to work in similar ways, it could be possible to make a real difference. Around the world, more than 40 countries have imposed laws to cut down on plastics. In 2002, Bangladesh was the first to prohibit thin plastic bags after they clogged storm drains during devastating floods. And in Malaysia's federal territories, a recent ban has been imposed on plastic bags in favor of biodegradable and compostable bags and food containers. While in Kenya, it's become illegal to produce, sell, and use plastic bags with a penalty of up to four years in jail or a $40,000 fine. But is it too little too late? Plastics may be being banned on land, but they've already made their way into the sea. Floating between California and Hawaii is a massive clump of trash known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's the size of Texas and still growing. While in the deep sea, one of the most inhospitable places on Earth, scientists have found plastic items almost completely intact. But even more troubling is what happens when plastic does degrade. Microplastics are fibres, beads, granules of plastic, which are defined by being less than five millimetres in size. They start off as large pieces of plastic, and then due to littering, runoff, or poor waste management, they end up in the marine environment. And when they're there, they're exposed to sunlight. The sunlight makes them brittle, and the action of the wind and the waves just breaks them down, and they become smaller and smaller. They don't biodegrade, they don't ever really go away. And because they're very small, then they can be readily ingested by a number of different marine animals. And they can reduce the amount of food that they consume. And in turn, that has a knock-on effect on their growth and reproducibility. We have found microplastics everywhere we've looked. We, we found them on the surface of the ocean, we found them through the water column. We found them in animals like crabs and worms that live at the bottom of the seabed. So the plastic really is getting everywhere. Twenty-five million tonnes of plastic waste is produced by Europe each year. In France alone, five billion plastic cups are thrown away annually. Like many other countries across the world, France faces a monumental plastic waste problem. And this is driving a growing number of campaigners and entrepreneurs to challenge the way that plastic is used and made. Will they be able to end the country's dependence on this all-pervasive material? 25% of all plastic is recycled in France, with the rest ending up in landfills, or worse, illegally dumped. I'm meeting councillor and environmental campaigner Arash Derembarche at one of the many tips surrounding Paris. Lorsque vous voyez par exemple ici tous les plastiques, c'est un problème. Et c'est un problème. C'est-à-dire qu'on a construit en fait des, matéri des, ma des matériaux et on ne sait pas quoi en faire après. C'est absurde. Il y a plus de 100 milliards, 100 milliards de sacs plastiques qui sont euh, dilapidés dans le monde. Nous, en France, on a entre 3 et 5 milliards. C'est énorme. Nous avons fait voter une loi en France en 2015, c'est que les supermarchés ne peuvent plus vendre des sacs euh, d'une certaine dimension dans les supermarchés, notamment dans les centres de vente. Pourquoi Parce que 
on a essayé d'enclencher cette révolution écologique. France's 2015 ban is a good start to encourage people to reduce their reliance on plastic. But the next target is 2020, when the country will be the first to ban single-use items like plastic cups, plates and cutlery. So I'm embarking on a road trip around France to find out how ready industry and people are for the changes ahead. First up, some roadside services. So I just stopped to get some water and a coffee. There's plastic everywhere. One thing is clear. It's going to take serious innovation to wean us off plastics. But on the beach in San Malo, there's a possible solution. David Cotti manages Algopack, a startup creating plastic from seaweed. So why is seaweed good as a plastics alternative? Great advantage of seaweed is uh, renewable and it's unlimited. We don't uh, need to harvest seaweed on a field and uh, it's uh, fully biodegradable. It goes back to the sea. What is it about seaweed scientifically? The makeup, what is it that so makes it? Basically, what is good in seaweed is the polymer chain, which is very similar to the polymer chain you can find in the uh, oil based plastics. Petroleum based polymers are long chains of carbon atoms bonded together. These are produced synthetically to form conventional plastic, but they can also be made from a wide range of biomaterials like vegetable oil or algae, like seaweed. David has asked me to help him to collect the brown variety, which also happens to be a non-native species. The real idea that we have is to take the seaweed, uh, which is invasive, which is a pollution in fact, and which is uh, at the date of today burnt. So this can be a plastics alternative? So it's not going to be a plastic, it's going to be a material, bio-based, fully bio-based material, uh, which will have certain characteristics similar to plastics. Algopack started in 2010. And each year they sell 40 tons of 100% bioplastic made from hundreds of tons of seaweed. There it is, our treasure. Xavier Le Metaillet is in charge of production at the plant. What are the other ingredients that are in this vat? Ça, on donne pas tous les ingrédients qu'on met dedans. C'est le savoir-faire, ça. Xavier is playing this one close to his chest. It is commercially sensitive, after all. And from where I stand, the process looks involved. First, the seaweed is turned into something that looks like Play-Doh before it's dried in an oven for 15 hours. After that, it's pulverized. This batch here is destined to become flower pots. What exactly does this machine do? Elle permet de transformer la poudre en produit algopac. Okay. Donc c'est une transformation qui se fait en fonction des critères de température et de pression qu'on a défini. C'est-à-dire qu'on a mis un, au point un programme qui nous permet effectivement d'assurer la transformation de la poudre en matériaux solides. There we go. Straight to the garden center. We have 16 small flower pots. How long does something like this take to decompose? It can take uh, up to four months, 12 months, depending as well on the coating that we can uh, provide. If this was a plastic pot, how long would that take to decompose? 500 years. It will last 500 years in the nature. So you're looking at 500 years against four months. Do you see a gap in the market for your product? The law um, will give a room in the market, but this room should be at the same price. 98% of the people are ready to go for something which is greener, which is better for the environment, but at the same price. Right now, Algopack is the more expensive option for consumers, but David's hopeful that in 12 to 18 months, they can step up production to offer products that are only 15% more expensive than conventional plastics. The seaweed alternative to plastic was really impressive, but there are limitations. Commercial viability is a super important thing. But if these can be overcome, I think it's got potential. With the ban looming, startups around France are experimenting with plastic alternatives 
from materials like milk and cornstarch. I'm off to see another venture in Sant. Nicolas Mouflet is an engineer who recently has developed what he calls the vegan bottle from an ingredient found in most of our cupboards in its refined form. What is this product that you want to show us? It's sugar cane. Sugar cane? Yes. How do you turn this into this? La première étape, c'est qu'à partir de la canne à sucre, on va réussir à faire un premier granulé oui. euh, qui ressemble à du plastique, mais c'est du bioplastique. Ensuite, ces granulés, on va les transformer en petits tubes. C'est une préforme qui va nous permettre de fabriquer différentes bouteilles. Donc voici euh, un exemple d'une bouteille euh, à partir de la canne à sucre euh, qu'on fabrique ici dans notre usine pour nos clients. Where does the sugar cane come from? Indonésie. Indonesia. Oui. And who does the transformation from the sugar cane to these pellets here? Pour la première étape, c'est fait en Indonésie. Et après, oui. en France, on transforme ça dans un nouveau compound, un nouveau granulé, pour pouvoir faire justement nos préformes et nos bouteilles. As at the other plant, Nicolas is guarding his formula closely. I can see why. The results look good. So it's actually food, a food product. Yes. So if I, I finished my juice in this bottle oui. and I want to dispose of it, I don't necessarily need to put it in the plastics waste. You put it in the food waste. On met ça effectivement avec les déchets alimentaires pour que ça soit composté. Quelques mois, euh, un peu moins de six mois, si c'est dans un composteur industriel, pour disparaître proprement euh, dans la terre. That's amazing. But to reduce the need to grow and transport sugarcane, I can't help feeling it would be better to simply reuse them. Nevertheless, Nicolas' vegan bottles are a success. He's had orders for two million last year and expects even more for 2018. But like the seaweed packaging, these bottles are more expensive than conventional plastic, 25% more expensive to be precise. So, could something like this really take off? So I'm here in beautiful La Rochelle, and I've been told that this cafe sells the sugarcane bottles. I'm curious to know if anyone can tell the difference, or if it even matters to them. So does this look like plastic to you? Oui, pour moi, ça ressemble à du plastique, oui. And how does it feel to know that it's not plastic? Bah, pour moi, c'est étonnant, parce que j'aurais cru vraiment que c'était du plastique, et c'est pas plus mal pour l'environnement. Does that affect your decision to purchase these types of bottles? Of course, it's good to purchase something and be able to uh, be good to, uh, with the environment. That was an overwhelmingly positive response, and it gives me lots of hope for the future. But is it really going to be so easy to rid ourselves of plastics? I'm heading back to Paris to meet up again with activist Arash to find out what he thinks. Arash, can we just stop using plastic? Oui, on peut stopper le plastique, mais ça va mettre du temps. Et pour cela, ça doit être un mouvement global. Les citoyens et des politiques, mais aussi des entreprises. Parce que dans cette, dans cette histoire, les lobbies ont beaucoup d'influence. Donc il faut que les politiques disent aux lobbies non, mais on va vous aider à faire autre chose. France's ban is a significant step in the right direction. It will take bold political moves like this, plus ingenuity and better choices on everyone's part to make plastic a thing of the past. Our planet is suffocating from plastic pollution, but around the world, people are taking steps to reduce, reuse and recycle. In Africa, only 10% of solid waste is collected, mostly because of problems with accessibility. But a social enterprise in Lagos, Nigeria, is sending teams on bicycles to collect recyclable materials incentivizing people by offering goods for their waste via a point system. And in Kenya, where as many as 90 tons of flip-flops wash up on the coast per year, traditional shipbuilders are now collecting them to construct boats. Projects like these are a start in helping countries and communities tackle the global plastic problem at a local level. They're key to turning the tide on plastic before it's too late.